podcast where we talk to smart people, but not necessarily done by smart people. That is an awesome question. This one goes down probably on one of my top five. Hey, I like nutrition. I like to eat food. This is the coolest thing ever. We're going to do this forever. I wish I paid more attention in that class. You know, I'm going to be honest. I don't understand that. <laughs> As a man, I just, I don't get it. Welcome to welcome smartpeoplepodcast.com. To smartpeoplepodcast.com. Hello and welcome to Smart People Podcast, conversation that satisfy your curious mind. Chris Stemp here, so excited to have you with us as we bring you a really enlightening episode in my mind. Now, one thing I want to highlight is this episode has some similarities uh, to our last one. And frankly, it wasn't really intentional, but I don't think it's a bad thing. Because this week we're talking about how to live a values-based life and what that means. And then in our last episode, we were talking about really happiness and the science behind it. And yes, they go hand in hand, but they're very complementary. And you would not believe how much positive feedback we got regarding our last episode. My point is, I think right now is a time we all need to stop and think about happiness and what we value and what we want and how to enjoy our time here. And I'm not just talking about the craziness with the election and here in the States or COVID or social media or all the ills of society. I just mean, it's this bundle of things that have really thrown many of us for a loop. So no better time to almost reset and think about what is our path forward. And I think this episode is a big part of doing that. So this week on the show, we are interviewing Harry Kramer. Harry Kramer is a professor of management and strategy at Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management, where he teaches in the MBA and executive MBA programs. Additionally, he is an executive partner with Madison Dearborn Partners, one of the largest private equity firms in the U.S. And something really cool Harry is the former chairman and CEO of Baxter International Inc., which is a multi-billion dollar global healthcare company. Oh, and he was voted by the students at Kellogg as the professor of the year in 2008 and was a finalist for the award in 2014. He is also the author of the new book called Your 168, Finding Purpose and Satisfaction in a Values-Based Life. One of the things I really enjoyed is, as I mentioned, Harry was the former CEO of a multi-billion dollar global healthcare organization, and he's talking about a values-based life. Now, many of us know that healthcare companies get a bad rap, CEOs get a bad rap, CEOs of big healthcare companies get a bad rap. So it's interesting to talk to somebody who has kind of reached that pinnacle and, and, and been at the top of a global organization to hear them talk about living a values-based life and leading in a values-based way. In fact, he's written a number of books about leading in a values-based way. My point is I really loved his perspective. He changed my paradigm on a lot of these topics, and he also helped solidify my understanding of what it means to focus on your values. So I really hope you enjoy this episode. Look, if you do, reach out to us, smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. Additionally, we can always use your support, patreon.com slash smartpeoplepodcast. If you're feeling supportive this holiday season, for as little as two bucks a month, you can ask our guests questions, you get ad-free episodes, your own RSS feed with those episodes straight to your iPhone, and you get a line to us. So if you want to ask me questions or make recommendations, feel free, patreon.com slash smartpeoplepodcast. All right, let's get into it as we are talking to Harry Kramer about how to live a values-based life. Enjoy. All right. Well, first, I just wanted to say thank you so much for being on the show. It's great to be with you, Chris. I'm looking forward to it. So as I was kind of mentioning before I hit record, a lot of what you talk about, your books, your leadership style, it's it's a values-based approach. And I really, I want to get into where this came from, how you developed it. But before we get into your journey, I also want to clarify, what does it mean to live a values-based life? So I guess the way I think about it, Chris, is that um, very, very often uh, people talk about um, 
they're having trouble figuring out what's important in their life. And you'll hear people talk about, well, I need to create some kind of balance in my life. And you'll hear this expression all the time about, well, uh, it's something to do with work-life balance. And I always say, wait a minute, work-life balance, think about that slowly. You're either working or you're living. And some of us are working enough that that's not living, you know, we've got a little bit of a problem. So mm -hmm. I always try to get people to think about life balance and what are the things that are really, truly important in your life? Not, not what you just say, but what are they and, and are you doing them? And what I found uh, even before I started teaching, Chris, is that very, very often, uh, I'm sure you'll see this, people may come up to you and they'll say, you know, Harry, I'm, I'm having trouble balancing my life. I'm having trouble balancing my life. And I have found over time, my opinion is that many people that are having trouble balancing their lives haven't figured out what they're trying to balance. And so mm -hmm. in my mind, it all starts with being self-reflective, being self-aware to determine what your values are, what really matters. And until you figure that out, I think it's hard to do anything in your life. Wow. If that's not a hook, I don't know what is. I mean, <laughs> I, I just heard a collective of tens of thousands of people listening to this going, all right, time to, time to turn the volume up and dig into this conversation. And I cannot wait because you are speaking my language. So we are going to we're going to pick back up from there in a moment. But I want to bring us back because you mentioned this actually started for you quite some time ago and it has led to what anyone would describe as an incredibly successful career. So take us back to where this started and where the idea of living your values and understanding your values specifically you came from. So uh, I'm smiling, Chris, just because I, I love your enthusiasm. The, mm -hmm. the, the crazy story that, uh, that I often tell is I went to a small college in Wisconsin, uh, Lawrence University, um, in Appleton, Wisconsin. And when I was a senior, and I admit this now, Chris, I, I may not have admitted this a long time ago, this directly, but I, I met a young woman who was a freshman. I was a senior. In fact, it was worse than that, Chris. It was her first day of college. Uh, and I had the best job on campus. I ran the uh, the checkout desk at the library. You you couldn't check out a book if I didn't know who you were. So <laughs> I met this young lady. I start dating her. I'm a senior. I graduate early, and I come down to Chicago. Well, and I tell my five children they can't do this now, Chris. But um, every other weekend I would hitchhike. I tell them they can't do this now, but this was 40 <laughs> years ago. I would hitchhike up to Appleton, Wisconsin, 183 miles from Evanston, Illinois, and I did this for a couple of months, and then suddenly. I get a phone call uh, one night from her father, very serious guy, very serious guy up in Minnesota. And he said, hey, I know what's going on. You know, you're dating my daughter. This sounds like it's serious. We need to spend some time together. And I said, oh, for sure. I know. Come on down. You know, super. Come on down to Chicago. No, you come to Minnesota. Uh, we need to spend some time. And I said, oh, OK. And he gave me the week to, 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 uh, to fly up there. So I get off the airplane, and this was, you know, 40 years ago, Chris. So this is before Al Gore and the internet and everything else. I got a little picture of this guy. Hmm. And uh, he basically, uh, I said, oh, it was, by the way, first mistake I made, Chris, was it was um, the first weekend in December. So if you've ever been to Minnesota, the first weekend in December, we're talking, you know, 20 below, it's snowing. And I thought, okay, we're going to go to a Viking game, or what are we going to do? And he said, no, no, no. He said, I, I, I got the idea for you. We're, we're, uh, I got something planned. I said, what are we doing? He said, we're going to go on a retreat. And oh, I, said, wow. I said, what's a retreat? And he goes, well, you'll find out. He said, but you're going to spend a little bit of time thinking about your values, your purpose, what matters. I didn't say super. I was just listening. Then he said something, Chris, that, that bothered me. But um, I thought, boy, if I had known this, I wouldn't have flown up there. He said, I should probably tell you before we go out there. He said, it's a silent retreat. I said, what does that mean? He said, you can't shut up for three minutes. You're not going to be talking for the next three days. And of course, that's when I had to ask myself the obvious question, how much do I like this guy's daughter? But That was exactly you know, my thinking. I was yeah, like, yeah. if you could go back, knowing what you knew at that moment, what are the chances you would have asked for her number? Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly. So since I think you said you were also a finance guy, uh, I started yep. up in finance and Chris, I thought to myself, well, you know, sunk cost, I'm already there. I might as well figure out what the heck is going on with this guy. So I ended up going on this thing. And it was a three-day silent retreat. It was run by the Jesuits. Uh, they, they give you all kinds of exercises. You know, you're, you're, um, you're flying home. The, flight go, the plane goes down. What would you have said to your you know, significant other? Now, if you and I think about that for five minutes, you've got something down. But if you've got three days and nothing to do, um, you actually get kind of emotional about this. 
Mm -hmm. And the whole thought was, you know, not what your preferences are, not what are your values? What are the things that are non-negotiable? What are the things you'd never compromise? Uh, you know, is, and what's your spiritual perspective? And so I did this for three days. Most people can't believe I did this. And at the very end, Chris, the last day before you leave, they said, this shouldn't be a one-time exercise. You should spend uh, 15 minutes a day doing a personal self-examination. And I thought, well, okay, I'll, I'll try that. So um, I've done that every day, Chris, for the last uh, 40 days, and I'll explain what I do. But here's the end of the story. Um, I married his daughter. And for the last now, uh, Chris, uh, I think this will be my, the 40th consecutive year, wherever I am in the world, even when I was the CEO of Baxter or running around on boards, and usually I'm out of the country once a month, but for the last now 40 consecutive years, Chris, the first weekend in December, uh, those three and a half days, I fly to Minnesota and I go on this uh, silent retreat with my, uh, with my father-in-law. Wow. And, wow. And the you, best, I mean, and the best you need life, to, I, I'm sure you have, mm -hmm. but the amount of thanks you probably owe him for that moment is incredible. Unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, unbelievable, Chris. Unbelievable. Because I mean, if, if you think about what most of us do in our, in our jobs and maybe in, you do in your career is, you know, you, you have like a little bit of a strategic plan about where you want to go. And then you sort of operationally see how you're doing. And basically what I've been able to do, even before I started my first job, I spend three days uh, once a year literally asking, what are my values? What's my purpose? What matters? What kind of a leader do I want to be? What kind of example do I want to set for others? And then on a daily basis, Chief, and again, I do it every day. I did it last night. Um, I go through this personal self-examination. And it's mm -hmm. a very simple one. What did I say I was going to do today? What did I actually do? What am I proud of? What am I not proud of? How did I lead people? How did I follow people? If I lived today over again, Chris, what would I have done differently? And then the last one is if I have tomorrow, being fully well aware that sooner or later I won't, but if I do have tomorrow and I'm a learning person, based on what I learned today, how will I operate differently tomorrow based on what's really important to me? And that could be, you know, for depending on the person, uh, but for me, it's my family, it's my spirituality, it's my health, it's being a leader, it's making a difference, it's being a good professor, um, whatever. And it'll be different for each person, Chris, because the whole idea is what really matters to you? What is your purpose? What difference do you want to make? The blink of an eye you happen to be passing through here. I have so many questions. My head is exploding. All right, let's start. Let's start here. Um, for those listening, and I'll, I'll do this in the intro, but well, first of all, we will list those questions you just posted. We'll list them on our website. So if you're listening in the car and you're like, wait, what were those? Just go to smartpeoplepodcast.com, go to this episode, and we'll list those if you want to copy that kind of um, ritual there that you went through. Well, but, and I, and I, can, I can send those to you, Chris. And then also uh, my students, my Kellogg students that are really into this with me, um, mm -hmm. they've, they've actually set up a website for me. It's just harrykramer.org, and all the questions will be there on those on there as well. Oh. Oh, beautiful. Okay. Even better. So harrykramer.org will link to that as well. Cause I want you to have those, but let's talk about what you've accomplished since that fateful, uh, you know, meeting with your future wife at the library there or at the bookstore, you have become the, you were the CEO of Baxter international, which is approximately a $12 billion global healthcare company. You are, um, a professor at uh, Northwestern University's Kellogg School of Management. You are named the Professor of the Year. Um, you've written a number of books. You're on the board of, you know, all types of companies. Um, you worked for Bank of America in corporate banking. I mean, look, obviously you have accomplished things that very few do and many want. And what I'd like to ask first is, what do you think is the number, if you could think of the number one or perhaps one of the most important things that got you from the person who had to hitchhike to go meet somebody to the CEO of a multi-billion dollar global organization, what was it? What, what do you think is one of the biggest contributors to that growth? Honestly, Chris, I, I, if I had to summarize it, I would probably say taking the time to be self-reflective and figuring out what really matters uh, and being disciplined and focused enough to always pushing myself to make sure that I stayed as close to that as I could, no, no matter no matter what I do. I love it. Okay. 
Now, the next question along those lines is, you have clearly taken, taken a route that is, how should I say, it's well known, okay? It's not well worn because few people reach those levels, but a lot of people, you know, work in big industries, try to climb the ladder, et cetera. And what I find fascinating is when I, and this is my own bias, tend to think about values-based living or when I hear it out there in the world, it's oftentimes very maybe passion oriented. So it's things like, I want to become an artist, a musician, you know, it's, it's family focused. And so I'm wondering how do you follow this values-based approach in a very competitive landscape like healthcare or finance? Like sometimes they seem at odds to me. And I'm wondering if you ever felt those competing forces. Yeah, Chris, yeah, you ask great questions. So let me, let me try to, let me try to uh, address this. But as always, the more you jump in, the better, the more you challenge, the, the more, the more I enjoy it. So sure. I, I guess, I guess what I did as part of the self-reflection chief is, is literally, and again, just being very open, I, I try to keep things very, very simple. And by the way, that's one of my hallmarks of you, you got to keep this very, very simple. And very often, Chris, somebody will say, well, Harry, it's complicated. And I'll say, well, I got a better idea. Why don't you go back to your office? Why don't you figure out how to make it simple? Then we'll talk about it. And they'll say, <laughs> and they'll say, well, then Chris, they'll say, well, it's very complicated. And they'll say, well, that's why we have you. That's why we call it work. And by the way, Chris, if it was already simple, we, we may not need you. Okay. That's a good right. technique, by the way. And so, so the approach I took when I was first coming out of school, Chris, is I said, all right, how, how am I going to decide um, whether to stay in a particular organization, in a particular job, or, or go someplace else? And I literally jotted down in one of my nightly self-reflections is that I, I would put together three criteria. And I encourage everybody to put a couple uh, criteria together. It'll it'll be different. But my three criteria, believe it or not, Chris, that I put together 40 years ago was this. Number one, if if I do this, will I have the opportunity to learn and grow? I'm here for a short period of time. If I'm not learning and growing, I'm going backwards. Number one. Number two, if I do this or continue to do this, will I be able to add value and make a difference? Or have I somehow got myself trapped that somebody's paying me money, but but I'm not really adding value and, and making a difference? And the third one for me, a big one for me, Chris, am I having fun? I mean, if I'm not having fun, what am I doing here? And by the way, this number three, Chris, always has an asterisk attached to it, which is a comment my grandfather made to me, which is, Harry, Harry, there's a reason they call it work. Okay, so Hmm. it's not going to be fun 24-7. But in general, if you love what you're doing, Chris, and uh, I'm looking at my watch to figure out when I can get out of there, you know, you're going to pass me like like I'm standing still. So, Hmm. So this whole idea of, learning and growing, making a difference, having fun, and not really worrying a whole lot, Chris, about the corporate ladder. I mean, what is always interesting to me is you got all these people, you know, how, how do I become a director? How do I become a vice president? How do I, And when students even ask me to this day, Chris, they'll say, when did you decide that you were going to become a vice president or the CFO or the CEO? And when I first tell them, I never, I never dreamed I'd be in these jobs. You know, you get the little bit of the eyeball roll of, okay, here's another one of these. Here's another one of these humility things. And I honestly say, Chris, if you think about it, it, it works the opposite, right? I mean, if I create an environment that everybody wants to work for me and I'm giving people the credit and all the kind of things you'd like to see in a leader, well, then you'll attract really good people to work for you. But if I wake mm-hmm. up one morning, Chris, and say, hey, you know what, Chris, you know what? I'm going for it. I'm going to become the CEO. Well, then it's all about me. The day it's all about me, it's no longer all about the team. And what's very interesting to me is often students will say to me, well, boy, you know, if you were the the CFO of a $12 billion company when you were 36 or the CEO when you were 42, you, you must have been this really bright guy. And this sounds like a humility thing, but I don't mean it to be that way, Chris. I always tell folks, as a result of being self reflective, I realized there were two things if I'm really honest about it, that I had going for me. And even now as a professor, two things. Number one, I literally made sure I got to know as many people as possible and really figuring out who are the really good people, not just analytical skills, but people skills, but value skills. And I created an environment, Chris, that everybody wanted to work for me. Well, here's Mm -hmm. a simple equation. If you know who all the really good people are, and you create an environment, and it's not about you, but it's about them. 
and they att- want to work for you, you're going to do remarkably well, remarkably mm. well, wh- whatever you do. So in my mind, this idea of keeping it simple uh, and deciding what makes sense um, and then always challenging yourself was, uh, again, it sounds really simple, Chris, but I think most of these things are simple. And now a quick word from one of this week's sponsors. This week's episode is brought to you by the Georgetown School of Business. At Smart People Podcast, you know we're all about education. Whether that's learning from podcasts, from reading, or heading back to school, we're all about learning and growing. At the Georgetown School of Business, the incoming MBA classes represents 42 different countries, and 67% of students have lived, worked, or studied abroad. This multiculturalism is just one of the ways Georgetown exposes you to diverse perspectives and prepares you to excel on the global stage. The Recruiter Insights Report from Bloomberg Businessweek rated Georgetown MBAs as the world's most innovative and creative graduates and the world's best trained graduates. When you choose a Georgetown MBA, you can feel confident you're getting a good return on your investment. Last year's graduating class once again secured impressive starting salaries with offers from top employers. So listen up. If you've ever been thinking about going back for your MBA, explore the full-time and flex MBA programs and discover how Georgetown McDonough can help you launch the career you want at choosegeorgetown.com slash MBA. Again, that's choosegeorgetown.com slash MBA. And now back to the episode. No, it's actually, I think what you're falling into is one of those things. I talk about it a lot in, in training is you've been doing it for so long. It might seem simple or maybe even obvious. I mean, you work with students, so you get to see the flip side. But in my opinion, you're actually approaching it the complete opposite way or or back to front instead of front to back, right? So instead of saying, okay, I have goals, I have these aspirations, I want to climb the ladder, I want to get here, I want to make a lot of money, it's no, I want to enjoy what I do and have a positive influence on those around me. And the more of them I attract, the more I'll naturally gl- grow. Uh, it, it, you know, it almost seems too good to be true, but from a logical perspective, it makes sense. Absolutely. Well said, Chris. Well said. So I, I, here's the other thing I get stuck on, right? Um, you know, I'm sure for somebody as thoughtful as you, ever since you were a young adult thinking about the impact I want to have, what I want to do. Did at any point you struggle with the fact that, well, if I want to have a lot of impact, I want to go work for the man and do finance or things like that. You know, I, it's not, I want to go work for Greenpeace or, you know, a Red Cross. I mean, that is something that I struggle with, right? Because it's this mixture between, well, I want to provide for my family and I want finances, but I really want to make a, a, a positive contribution to the world. And I always struggle with, am I going to do that? through commercial real estate, which is where I was at. How, how did you square that? Yeah, so that's that's a great one. So the way the way I've always thought about it, and again, a lot of this is from the retreats and so on, is I, uh, and, and when again, we'll come back to this simple thing. What do I know? I know, and I believe, I'm here for a very short period of time. I mean, you know, it's funny. I always, th- I tell the students that uh, I feel like when I'm teaching them in the same classroom that I taught in, you know, that I was in, you know, I said, was that, was that five years ago I was a student? No, that was 40 years ago. So I, I tell people, Chris, I, I went from being 25 to 65, like a blink of an eye. I mean, literally a blink of an eye. Wow. I don't feel much different than I did when I was 25. Now, I would say, snap my fingers, uh, another 40 years go by, I'd be 105 if I was around that long, okay? Mm-hmm. So when you, when you realize life's short and you're, and you're really thinking about, hey, I want to set an example. I kind of want to prepare myself, you know, for eternity. What am I going to do? And I realized it doesn't matter what I do. In fact, I could even be in commercial real estate. If I'm literally trying to learn and grow, if I'm adding value, if, if I'm setting a positive example, because at the end of the day, if, if you have strong values, the more people you can impact in whatever you're doing. And, and I would almost argue that uh, even in areas that you may say, oh, you know, I don't know about banking or whatever. I kind of look at it as it'd be really good to have a couple really, really strong values driven people in these organizations. Now, if, if you've got a particular calling for Greenpeace or something, you know, super. But I, I almost kind of viewed it as it doesn't really almost matter where I am as much as am I truly, through my example, making an enormous difference on other people? Because mm. as, as you may know, Chris, from your work and your coaching, the, the to me, as a leader, you have an ability, you have the opportunity 
to make an enormous difference in people's lives. The problem is, without mentioning names, you look at some of the people in these leadership positions and yeah, 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 they're, they're making an impact, but it's the worst right. impact known to mankind, right? So, yep. so, but if you're setting an example, everything you do can have an enormous impact on other people. So I, I worry about less about what I'm doing and can I really make an impact? If you said to me, what did you most enjoy of, of, uh, of being the CEO of Baxter, okay? Well, I got to tell you, it was never the money. It was never the power. It was, wow, through my behavior, I can have an enormous influence on, on 55,000 people. Uh, wow. well, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a simple example, Chris, where you, you're you doing these things and you don't even realize. I would often, because um, as you know, the power of stories, and, and I would often, I'd write a monthly note uh, that would, went out to all the, all the entire team, and I would usually tie it to something that I thought was important. You know, like, uh, hey, as a big organization, you know, we need to be more flexible. But rather than just saying that, I would try to give an example. And I didn't realize sometimes when you give examples, Chris, the impact you have on people's behavior. So the example that somebody reminded me of a couple weeks ago, I was really focusing on this, how do you be more flexible? And I said, hey, here's a good example. I'm, I'm teaching Sunday school, and I got this whole class of first graders, and it's re- preparing for, uh, for Christmas time, and we got to prepare the nativity, and I got to get, I got to have three of you uh, first graders to be the three kings. Well, there were like eight guys who wanted to be the three kings, and I'm starting to explain to them how there's three kings, and then I realized, wait a minute, let's be flexible. We're going to have eight kings. And so <laughs> we had eight kings, and I, and I put this, Chris, in this little note, no exaggeration. I got two, 200 and some emails from, from Baxter team members around the world saying, you know, uh, my spouse has been telling me I should teach Sunday school. And uh, I told him I'm too busy. But if you're the CFO of a $12 billion company, you know what? I'm going to start doing it. And Chris, that had nothing to do with why I sent the note out. But mm. you realize the impact that you can have on other people. And for me, you know, that's the whole reason I teach now. I mean, I could be mm. doing a lot of things, but I think to myself, yeah. We're living in a world now where I really, really think we need more value-based leaders. Well, if I can have a small impact on the next generation of people that are going to be leading things, that that feels pretty good. You know, I, again, I'm just so in, tu- I, in tune with your mindset. I really enjoy it because this took me a long time to realize. And I know a lot of people listening are in different stages of their career and things like that. But I remember always thinking, you know, corporations, large corporations, ugh, I don't want to go there. I don't, I want to do something that has meaning and I don't want to be dragged down by red tape and bureaucracy. And I'll never forget. Somebody said, Hey, Chris, what are corporations made of? And I was like, well, you know, people, he was like, and you want to help people. And I said, yeah. And he said, so you can go give a speech somewhere and maybe there's a hundred or 200 or a thousand or whatever, or you might be able to go to an organization and impact thousands or go to multiple, which is what I ended up doing new organization almost every day hundred people here, hundred people there. And I was like, huh? So you're just this person. I was like, you're just viewing an organization as a condensed group of people that you can potentially impact. And then they go out and spread it. And it was just this paradigm shift for me of not looking at the logo on the building, but the people that make it up and the lives, the individual lives they lead and how you can have an impact on them. Absolutely. 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 And, really, the other, and the other yeah. and the other fun thing, Chris, is you sometimes you'll be in an organization and I'll just even role play one of these with you. You know, people mm-hmm. say, oh, well, OK, uh, you know, I, I'm a, a manager level and and I'm just making it up. And Chris is the vice president and, and Chris is not a good guy and he's swearing at people or belittling people. And, you know, uh, wh- wh- why am I there? Well, I kind of look at it and say, all right, well, wait a minute. OK, so you're the vice president. And there's four managers. I'm one of the four that report to you. And each of us has 20 folks. Well, I look at it and say, well, maybe maybe Chris doesn't treat people well because because he was never taught that. Maybe he never thought about that. Maybe, I don't know, maybe he had the wrong parents. I don't know, something something went wrong with this guy. Mm -hmm. And so I look at it and say, I can either talk about the fact that you're, you're not being a great guy, or I can say, wait a minute, why don't I demonstrate with my 20 people how this really ought to be done? how people ought to be treated, how people ought to be developed. And then maybe, Chris, when you look at the four of us and you're a bright guy and you're looking at us and say, well, why does everybody want to work for Harry? 
What, why, why do those people never wants to leave there? And by the way, when somebody does leave there, they're always promoted into higher level. What, you know, what, what could I learn? Because you realize you're, you're just not leading and developing the people below you. You can mm-hmm. actually lead and influence the people that are above you. And mm-hmm. if you look at some of the crazy things that are going on in the world, you can say, well, I'm not going to go there. Or do you say, well, wait a minute. No, that company, that place desperately needs somebody to go in. And this, I always say, Chris, who's going to change the world? I mean, I can tell you're one of those kind of guys of who's going to mm-hmm. change the world. Well, I often tell the students, we literally will talk in class. We'll say, well, let's look at all the issues in the world. Global poverty, global health care, digital divide. Well, who's going to deal with all these issues? And I tease that there's this famous group of people, Chris, you usually run into called those guys. I mean, there's some magical group of men or women somewhere. No, we are those guys. I mean, if we're not the men and women that are going to do something about it, who is? Who is? Yep. That's something that this podcast has taught me. Again, lessons you can hear, but until you learn them on your own. And it's this, are we always looking to somebody else? You know, I've been talking with my wife a lot about the environment and We were watching documentaries and all this stuff. I mean, I've been into it for a long time. And you're like, wow, you know, uh, global warming is a thing or we're losing our topsoil or all these things. And you go, well, somebody's got to figure it out. (laughs) And you get to the point. If everybody's just pointing at each other, is that why we get into these issues in the first place? Exactly. Exactly. But you get to teach, you know, the the brightest of the bright and the upcoming. And so I I could see that being a, a very motivating and inspiring lesson there. I want to uh, touch on one more thing and then get back to this idea of life balance because it's fascinating. And I know people are like, Chris, you better not forget where we started. Um, <laughs> I want to ask you, you mentioned you have five kids and uh, I, I was thinking about this. Once I had kids, there were a lot of competing priorities and almost competing values. And now I will say, I know without a doubt that family is my number one value. It's just it always has been. It always will be. I'm assuming, and maybe I'm wrong, but I'm assuming if you have five kids, that's high up there on yours. How do you deal with the idea or the fact that, okay, I want to, you know, uh, be around my family, raise my kids, all these things, but I also have this high power, high level job that requires me to travel and be away from home. I always found that really stressful every trip I took. And I'm curious if you ever felt similarly. Absolutely, Chris. I mean, and it and it, it fits directly into this whole idea of, of life balance because I I literally I literally when I was um, at work and I'm sure you heard this all the time when people would talk about this work life balance and I said well no no let's talk about life balance and what I ended up doing for for the book Chris is I I interviewed a whole lot of people different ages different countries and I simply asked them how do you think about life balance. And it was very interesting, Chris. People would talk about where well, there's three areas that I'm tr- that I'm literally buckets. There's five. There's ten buckets. And it all, it turned out, Chris, that uh, there was an amazing normal distribution around six. That if you look at six buckets, it covers most of what you know. Eight, ninety-eight, ninety-nine people are trying to do. And by the way, some people don't even use all six. But in no particular order, Chris, I, I think of it as there's there's one bucket for. And I can send this to you, but there's like, there's one bucket for your career and your education. There's a second bucket for your family, your friends. There's a third bucket for your spirituality for some of us. There's a fourth bucket for your health. And let's put in a little bit of sleep, a little exercise in that bucket, Chris, hopefully. Uh, There's a fifth bucket for fun, enjoyment, you know, going to the movies, playing ball, whatever. And then there's a sixth bucket, which you've already touched on. Some people call it social responsibility, making a difference. I call it being a best citizen as as an individual and, and then your organization. And if you think of those six, I always tell folks, okay, well, now you need to really think through how you're going to divide your time up among those six, how you're going to do that. And what I and the exercise I have folks do, and you can have your, your, uh, your colleagues do this, uh, Chris, I'll literally say, here's an exercise. Now, only, Chris, only attempt this exercise when you're in a really good mood. Be in a really good mood. Because here it goes. You list these six, and the first column is the goal. What what percentage of your time, on average, Chris, would you want to spend on each of those six? That's the first column. The second column is current reality. Okay? This is where you take your calendar for the last, you know, four or five months, and on average, on average, where did you spend your time in a week? 
All right. And I say on average because, hey, if you spent the whole week in Europe doing a business trip, well, then it's, it's going to be a little odd, but on average. And then the third column, Chris, is the difference. And I've yet to meet the person, Chris, maybe it's you, who says, now there's an amazing coincidence. And my, my goal lines up with exactly where I'm spending my time. OK, mm. you haven't met that person yet. And there's going to be a difference. Right. We're all human. Um, but if there's if the difference is really big, Chris, is it because, well, I said something was important and it's really not or, oh, no, 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 it's really important. I'm just not disciplined um, and organized enough to spend the time with where I said I was. And I and I really believe taking the time to do that really starts to put this into perspective and then to have fun with uh, executives. When I visit companies, uh, Chris, I always say the sum of those six percentages, Chris, cannot exceed 100 percent. OK. Um, and some people say, well, Harry, uh, why is that? I said, well, some people literally will say I need 110 percent of you from you. I said, wait a minute. No, yeah. only 100 percent. And right. I think taking the time to really think through, you know, what's really important. And it, it's very interesting. If your family is really important, as I know I can tell it to you, is to you, Chris. Well, then then what are you doing to make sure you do that? And yes, of course, you've got to get the job done. But are you aware that when your daughter asks to go on a bike ride and you say, well, no, I can't do that right now because I'm doing this podcast with Chris. Do you know that you've said that? So therefore, tomorrow, Chris, when I'm off to play tennis with a couple of folks and she says, hey, dad, how about a bike ride? Oh, OK. No, I'm not playing tennis. I am going to go for that bike ride because that's really important to me. Are, are you aware when you're not focusing on something you said was important? Are you aware of how far off you are from what's important so that you get back in line again? So I, mm. I almost think of it, Chris, as I'll never achieve life balance. I'll pursue it. And do I know how far away from it I am? Yeah. And I, getting back to that life balance thing, I remember one thing somebody, again, I just learned either through the podcast or, or, or whatever it was, said, you know, think about when you're trying to balance physically. Like imagine you're walking a tightrope. What does balance look like? And it looks wobbly. It's back and forth. It's you're moving. Balance is not a steady state. And, and that changed things for me because it made me realize, to your point, as long as I'm thinking about it, cognizant of it, aware of it, there's going to be, you know, ebbs and flows or peaks and valleys to, to get as close to that equilibrium as you can, but not to worry so much about is it always in equilibrium? Because that's where you add the stress and that's actually not what balance is. Exactly. Exactly. And are you, yeah. are you making, are you making sure Chris, that the things that really, really are important that you're doing and the things that maybe are not as important that you're either limiting or eliminating completely. And what's very interesting, Chris, is there's an awful lot of people, very even intelligent people who don't even realize where they're spending their time. Uh, a, a, a very good example. A senior executive came up to me one time and said, "Hey, I really need to talk to you. I'm, I'm, I'm really struggling. I have marital issues. I, I, I'm spending. I have a hard time uh, with my three children. Harry, I'd really like to talk to you." And I said, "Well, look, I, I don't have any answers. No, no, but you've got opinions, and I, I'd love to chat with you." And I said, "All right. Well, I'll tell you what. No, we always help one another. I'll tell you what. Tomorrow's Saturday. Hey, why don't you come on over and we can sit in the back here. We can talk about. It. Well, I, I can't do it tomorrow. I'm golfing tomorrow." I said, all right, well, hey, Sunday after church, do you want to stop by? Well, I'm, I'm golfing on Sunday. Now, I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, as an old math major, I think it takes five hours to golf, and you're yeah. doing it twice over the weekend. That's 10 hours. Now, I'm so open, Chris. If if golfing for 10 hours is more important to somebody than their family, well, that's that's an individual choice they're making. But this guy sounded like he was surprised. And I, I may have mentioned earlier, one of the tremendous benefits of this self-reflection is it limits the surprise. And people that are not self-reflective, they're constantly surprised, and you're surprised they're surprised. I mean, it's mm. it's amazing the things people do, Chris, without thinking about why are they doing what they're doing. I mean, if you're if you say your children are important to you and you're not spending any time with them, well, wait a minute, are you surprised you don't have a relationship with them? It, right. It's it's remarkable to me. In fact, something you said, Chris, reminds me of another crazy analogy, which based on what you said, you, you'll relate to. I loved your balancing thing. Here was a crazy analogy I'm using in class these days. You and I are in Chicago and we're driving to New York. Now, if you and I are in a car and we're driving to New York, I, I think it's Route 80. And if we could literally stay on Route 80 and never get off an exit ramp, you know, maybe, maybe you could think about that as that line almost represents balance. But to your point, 
you know, it's what, 900 miles. So you want to get off and get a burger. I got to go to the restroom. Okay, we need gas. We, we never stay on that line, right? We're getting off a little mm. bit, all right? But to your point, do you know you're getting off? Do you know why you're getting off? It's that example of my daughter asking me to, 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 to uh, go for a bike ride. I'm going to remember that to get back on. And the reason the analogy works for me, Chris, is let's talk about what happens to a lot of people, unfortunately. And here's this one. You and I are driving from Chicago to New York. It's time for me to take a nap. You're driving. And all of a sudden you yell out, hey, Harry, I think we got a problem. I wake up. Well, Chris, what's the problem? Harry, Harry, I, I just saw a sign that says entering Miami. Now, I don't know the last time you've driven from Chicago to New York, but if you saw a sign that says entering Miami, we got a problem. And the work example of that, Chris, is you've seen this. You're, maybe you've coached these people. The person's gained 50 pounds. Their personal life is a wreck. OK, uh, they've yep. got high blood pressure. OK, they're this one of their children is a drug. They, they, they've, got, they've gotten so far off course, Chris, and they don't realize it. So to your point, you know, do you know where you are? Are you holding yourself accountable? That that to me is the value of this nightly self-examination, because there'll be a day. There'll be three days that, that I've gotten off course. But to say, wait a minute, if, if exercise is important to me, uh, am I exercising four or five times a week? And if I'm not. How can I say my health is really important to me? Mm -hmm. So it, it almost I, ends up. It almost ends up, Chris. Four words I, I I tell the students all the time: discipline, focus, consistency, credibility. I got to be disciplined. I have to stay focused, and if I do it consistently, then I start to establish a little credibility with myself. And now a quick word from one of this week's sponsors. This week's episode is brought to you by LinkedIn Jobs. Thanksgiving and Black Friday may look a little different this year, but there's still a lot to be thankful for. Like being able to find the right people for your team when the holiday rush has you ramping up your small business needs. So when you're ready to make that next hire, LinkedIn Jobs can help by matching your role with qualified candidates so you can find the right person for your business fast. When you're looking to hire for specific skills, what better way than to leverage the LinkedIn community? LinkedIn is an active community of professionals with more than 706 million members worldwide. Getting started is easier than ever with new features to help you find qualified candidates quickly. Post a job with targeted screening questions and they'll quickly get your role in front of more qualified candidates. Manage job posts and contact candidates from a single view on the familiar LinkedIn.com as functions are streamlined onto one simple screen. And now you can do all of this from your mobile device no matter where the day takes you. That's how LinkedIn Jobs can help you hire the right person faster. When your business is ready to make that next hire, find the right person with LinkedIn Jobs. You can pay what you want and get the first $50 off. Just visit linkedin.com slash smart. Again, that's linkedin.com slash smart to get $50 off your first job post. Terms and conditions apply. And now back to the episode. Well, and I think the part that you're saying that I agree with, as opposed to potentially a message like Gary Vaynerchuk, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but all of that only works if the thing that you're focused on and disciplined around and, you know, is something you want in your life. Absolutely. Right. So I think one of the biggest things for me and people listening know this, but my sign in Miami happened when I was about 23 years old. I was working in finance. And for the previous eight, nine years, I had always said my value or really hadn't questioned it that much, but my value was money, status, things that a young guy kind of wants oftentimes. And so that's why I went into finance. I avoided the mile markers until I got hit over the head with the, you're almost in Miami because it was a stress induced panic attack, and just health issues, just like out of left field. Now, looking back, I got lucky because I saw that sign at 22. It was going to come, right? It was going to come at 22, 30, 40, 50. doesn't matter. But the thing that I always go back to is I thought that I knew my values. And the thing that I try to tell others now, or I still try to learn is make sure they are your values and not somebody or something else's. You know, do you, have you talked about that? Do you cover that? Is that a, a thought where you notice people think that they've gone through their values, but they're still living for their parents, for society, for some other kind of thing that's not truly who they are? 
Chris, you're you're right on top of it. And we, I talk about this all the time. In fact, I'll, I'll give you another I'll give you another uh, deal, another story here. Because to your point, many many people, in fact, very bright people, you know, they go to undergraduate school, they work for a few years, they go to graduate school, and then they'll say to me, "Well, Harry, I'm trying to decide which of these two investment banks should I go to." And I'll say, "Well, wait a minute, wait a minute. Before we decide which investment bank." Why do you want to work for an investment bank? Maybe you do, but have you thought, is that what you really want to do? Or is that what you think other people expect of you? And I'll, I'll tell you a little story, Chris, that, that where I learned. And again, I was very, I was very fortunate. I learned a lot of this when I, when I was young. My, my parents, they were up in Minnesota. They would, um, when they retired, they went around in nursing homes and just put on a little show. My mother played the piano. My dad sang. And I would go to these shows once in a while because I was fascinated Chris, of just talking to older people in their 80s and, and getting a sense of what their life was like and what they learned. And the one that I usually tell the the, uh, uh, the students, Chris, there was one fellow who was in his mid-80s, and we got talking on a break of, you know, what you do. And he said to me, well, Harry, I'll tell you, uh, I've learned a lot. He said, uh, when, I was, when I was 45 or so, I really, truly wanted to teach. And I decided, well, I can't do that. I'm, I'm an attorney. I'm a general counsel. That's my job. And and I always wanted to do it, but I, I didn't do it because I was really, really worried, Chris. I was really worried. What would people think? What would people think? And he said, Harry, sitting here at 85, Harry, I got a very interesting view I want to share with you. And this is one of the reasons I ended up going to teach. He said, and I think this is true, Chris, for everybody. He said, if you're very lucky, if you're very blessed, there's two groups of people. The first group is maybe, maybe as many as 10 people. The other group is everybody else. Now, he said, let's talk about, let's talk about the two groups. He said, the first group of uh, eight to 10 people, these are the people, Chris, who really love you. They care. It could be your spouse, could be your children, could be your best friend. He said, Harry, these are the people you don't have to impress at all because all they want you to do is they want you to be happy. These are the people, Chris, when you say, oh, I just became a vice president, they say, well, are, are you taking care of yourself? Are you taking care of your health? I mean, you know, you, do you know your kids? So he said, you don't have to impress these people. He said, now you got the other group. Now, I said the other group is everybody else, and they're not bad people, but for the most part, they're mostly worried about themselves. They don't really have a whole lot of time to worry about what you're doing. So he says, as sitting here at 85 years old, when we say, well, what are people going to think? Well, who are these people, right? Why don't I take the time to figure out what, are, what values do I have? What matters to me? Um, what do I want to pursue to make a difference the, the short time I'm here versus about worrying about it because they're not really that worried about you. It's such a good point. And I, I think one of the reasons it's so important, and you probably see this being a professor, is that these things are compounded when we're younger. Absolutely. I mean, I can, I can almost delineate perfectly wh how my reliance on, and reliance is a strong word, but on others went. So from about zero to about 12, it was my immediate family, my brother, my mom, my dad. Then from about 12, to about 26, it was my friends entirely. Then from 26 to 30-ish, it, it was finally me. That was it. Like that was the first time I was like, wait a second, I've gotten this wildly wrong. I, I just need to rely on me. And then once I got that right, that opened me up to now a really great marriage and two great kids. So I can now kind of you know, go in reverse, help them, help my kids. And so I just say that because, you know, you've got, you know, decades of doing this, you've seen, you know, young adults, but it's a really hard thing to get across when you're 17, 18, 20, when you really believe that uh, your group is your friends and they're the ones who you need to impress or, or impress isn't even necessarily right. Cause I don't want to make it so, you know, so cliche. It's a deep-seated need to connect, and sometimes we feel that that connection comes through our title or our bank account or things like that. Exactly. Well said, Chris. Well said. Well said. I, I love this, and and so we've only got a few minutes left. I want to get into the tactical. You know, I know you've got this great book. It's called Your One Sixty Eight. Your One Hundred Sixty Eight: Finding Purpose and Satisfaction in a Values-Based Life. And we'll talk about that, even though this is what we've been talking about, but. If I'm listening and I go, okay, I get it, but where do I start? Like, how do I find my values? What are they? Is there a spreadsheet of different values? How do I do this? Yeah. So the way I think about it, Chief, and, and it's all laid, laid out in, in, in the book, 
um, the way I the way I try to get people to do it is you first the first step is taking time to start to be a little self reflective. You know, start jotting down. No kidding around. Forget about everybody else. What matters to me is it is it is it success or is it significance? Right? Is it you know how do how do I uh, you know uh, build my, my resume or is it, am I really truly thinking about the legacy that's going to be important to me when, I, when I'm no longer here? And almost immediately then, it's finding people, Chris, it's finding people who you believe have good values that you can talk to about this. You know, as my wife, Julie, will often say to me, hey, Harry, left to your own devices, you could convince yourself of anything. Do you want to know what I think? The answer to that better be yes, Chris. You know what that's like. Yes, it better be yes. Um, and finding people that, you know, so if I got to know you pretty well, Chris, and I say, hey, this is a good guy, he's got good values, I take you to lunch, Chris, and I say, hey, Chris, I want to lay out for you the things that I think are important to me. I want to get your sense of this. And think of the two re- two very different reactions I could get from you. One would be, hey, Harry, Harry, thanks for sharing that. Um, but you know what? I've been working with you for three years. Based on your actions, I could have guessed those are your values. I mean, you you live your values. Now, the bad mm. side would be you say to me, wow, based on your actions, I'm amazed you think those are your values. You're like Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, right? So mm. I, I think we, we're all human, right? We're all tempted. It'd be very easy to convince ourselves of things. So making sure you've got some good people that'll hold you accountable, say, wait a minute, Harry, based on those being your values, why did you do that? Why are you, why did you say that? Um, so I, I really believe that process of taking the time to think about it, start to write it down, find people you can bounce it off of, uh, and really ask yourself what, what, what truly does matter. Having that trusted confidant is a huge one. I think to your point, sometimes the people who care about us can see us better than we can see ourselves because we live in our heads. We live in this this crazy, crazy world. And you can just ask them. I'll never forget when 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 I was struggling with trying to find what strengths, where should I go? And other people were able to to highlight uh, what they saw so much faster than I could in my own. That's really shocking how other people can know us sometimes better than we can know ourselves, uh, at least in some areas. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, getting a collection of those people who will help you be held accountable, I think is a, is a very, very big piece. If, 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 if somebody really wants to take this seriously. Speaking of taking this seriously, you know, I'm kind of walking through it in my head and I feel like I've gone through a long journey and I'm, I'm doing a, a pretty good job at this point, finally. But I know that along the way, and even currently, I will go, all right, there's a part of my values that I, I'm not currently living. Um, and it's hard to not only admit it, but it's even harder to make a change. So let's say you are working in an industry and you realize, wow, like I'm off base here. Uh, what can people do to overcome? Maybe it's the fear, the uncertainty, you know, we're, we're leaving behind some of our, uh, our, our certainty, I guess, um, to move closer to who we actually are. Is there anything you've learned along the way that can help you make this transition if you're n- if you find out you're currently not living your values? Yeah, so a couple of a couple of uh, reactions, Chris, a couple of opinions. For, first of all, uh, if you're going to do this, so a lot of times students or executives will say, "Well, Harry, this would be pretty tough for me because if if on a nightly basis I'm going to talk about what went well, what didn't go well, you know, boy, I'm going to be depressed or you know, I'm going to be it's going to be hard for me to go to sleep or whatever." And I always say, "Well, wait a minute. No, one of the things about this that is really really important, Chris, is that this is not a destination. It's a journey. It's a journey, and you know, I'm never going to be perfect." All right. So sometimes I'm going to make mistakes. It's your comment about the balancing thing, which I'll I'll have to steal that one. I love that balancing. Yeah. So sometimes I'm going to fall off. Okay. When I fall off, am I going to pick myself up and get back on and and realize, okay, what did I learn from that? All right. It's a journey. I'm never going to be perfect Uh, and I'm not complacent. I'll learn from that and, and and I'll, and I'll, and I'll try to get better. And if I'm in an environment that somehow I've started to realize, wait a minute, I'm in an environment that's not a healthy environment. I always view it as, okay, two steps. The first step is, do I have the ability, do I have the skill set to be able to change this environment, maybe lead up and change the way my boss or somebody operates? But 
if I don't think I can, I mean, I, I'm not, I'm not going to be Don Quixote here. If I, if I don't think I can, well, then I've got to go someplace else. But I always say to myself, do I, do I have that ability to maybe have an influence? Maybe, maybe Chris isn't being a good guy because nobody ever gave him that feedback. Maybe, maybe I could figure out some way to do that. And, and if I can't, and I really believe I tried, well, then I got to go someplace else. But this whole idea of I, 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 I'm, I'm on a journey. It's a process. And, uh, you know, I'm not going to be too hard on myself because, I, in fact, maybe a best summary of it, Chris, is this may be helpful to your folks as well. It turns out, if we're honest, there's a series of things, Chris, that most of us spend more time dealing with than we wish we did. And I put them under the buckets, Chris, of worry, fear, anxiety, pressure, and stress, just to name five. And I'll, I'll, I'll tease executives. I'll say, what do you know about worry, fear, anxiety, pressure, and stress? And they'll say, well. <laughs> It's not healthy. Um, it's, it's very unproductive. It's a waste of time. But if, Chris, if you're upset about something and I say, hey, Chris, don't worry about it. Well, it's too late. You're, you're already worried. And so what I decided was, wait a minute, maybe by being self-reflective, I'll deal with these things before they occur because I know there's going to be difficult periods. So one of my very early retreats, Chris, many years ago, I decided when things are going well, this is the, this is the whole key, Chris. When things are going well, really, really well, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to be thankful. I'm going to have gratitude. I'm going to enjoy the moment. I'm truly, truly going to have it in my mind of how, how fortunate and blessed I am. But before the party ends, Chris, I'm going to ask myself the question, what am I going to do when, not if, what am I going to do when things turn down? And I decided, Chris, and this again sounds simple, I decided I would do two things. The first thing is I'll try to do the right thing, which by the way, that has a big asterisk on it. What's the right thing? I better surround myself with people that are good value-based leaders that will help me figure out what the right thing is, and I'll do the best I can do. And I literally will say that five times a day, Chris. I'll try to do the right thing. I'll do the best I can do. I'll try to do the right thing. I'll do the best I can do. And interestingly enough, Chris, if you can truly believe that, then worry, fear, anxiety, pressure, and stress can be significantly reduced. They can never be eliminated, right? Welcome to the real world. But yeah. that has an enormous impact on no matter what happens, I'll do the best I can and I'll try to do the right thing. It has an enormous impact on your ability to lead yourself and, and therefore to influence and, and lead others. I love it. Well, look, I mean, this is a subject we could talk about for days. And in fact, you have been writing about and talking about for quite some time. And so for everybody who who is just soaking this up as I am, it's the tip of the iceberg. I highly recommend your newest book, which again is called Your 168, Finding Purpose and Satisfaction in a Values-Based Life. Um, I just wanted to, Harry, give you one last second and, and let us know what uh, what's the website again and anywhere else where we can go to learn more about this and your philosophy and your approach to this. Yeah, well, sure. First, Chris, it's been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed it. We'll do it again sometime. The, um, the, the website is just... Uh, harrykramer.org and kramer is k-r-a-e-m-e-r.org and uh, again chris i'm one of these very open guys my kellogg students have attached a uh, uh, a blog uh, site to it so I, I try to do that every once in a while uh, and there's a lot of articles there you can uh, get access to the books from there um, and i uh, people can follow it i respond to every email if people have questions and uh, i uh, I really, really wish everybody the very, very best on their journey. Yeah, well, and we will link to that on our website because this is great stuff. So again, Harry, just wanted to say thank you so much. All right, you take good care, Chris. That was Harry Kramer. Hope you enjoyed the interview. Harry's book, Your 168, Finding Purpose and Satisfaction in a Values-Based Life, can be found wherever books are sold. Hey, if you're listening to this on Tuesday, November 3rd, and you live in the United States, please go out and vote. Make sure that your voice is heard. All right, let's get to the quick housekeeping. You've probably heard it before, but if you'd ever like to reach out to the show, you can email us at smartpeoplepodcast at gmail.com or message us on Twitter at smartpeoplepod. And if you're looking for free and easy ways to support the show, you can always head over to wherever you downloaded the podcast and leave us a rating or a review. And if you'd like to help us out monetarily, head over to patreon.com slash smart people podcast. And if you just want to stay up to date with all things smart people podcast, head over to the website, smartpeoplepodcast.com and sign up for the newsletter. 
All right, that's it for us this week. Make sure you stay tuned because we've got a lot of great interviews coming up and we'll see you all next episode. Don't forget, go vote.